Hello, welcome to Meet Me at the Movies. Noel T. Manning the second here, hanging out with uh, Thomas Manning. Um, yeah, some relation. And uh, we, we're, we're joined by uh, a an incredible person. I'll just start with that. Incredible person, uh, somebody I've, I've, I've known for, for a number of years, uh, Sean O'Connell, fellow film critic, um, uh, amazing uh, entertainment journalist, uh, an author, uh, and just a friend. And so, Sean, good to have you back. Really, really glad to have you on the show, buddy. It's an honor to be with both of you guys. I really do. Uh, I appreciate you guys having me on. It's it's great to be able to call you guys colleagues. Well, uh, we are going to celebrate today uh, the man by the name of Bruce Willis. Uh, and the reason uh, we're doing this, and not just, well, we can do it anytime. But we can celebrate <laughs> Bruce Willis anytime, but especially today because Sean has a book uh, celebrating the cinematic legacy of an unbreakable Hollywood icon. Bruce Willis is the is the, the header for that. That's the subtitle. Uh, Sean, your second book. Wrong answer. And um, we're, we're just gonna, glad to have you. Third, I'm sorry, third, third book. <laughs> Forgive Thank me, you, third book. Yes, yeah. third book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Snyder, Spider-Man, Bruce Willis. Um, I, you know, I, I never got past two when I could count. So Thomas, um, he's already exceeding <laughs> me in that. So third book, um, and thanks for correcting me on that, Thomas. Three is a magic number. Yes, it is. It's a magic number. Well, we're glad to have you, and I think we've had you on the show to talk about uh, about your previous two. So, you know, if I could keep track, I would know this is the third. So, we're glad to That's have fine. you. Man. They all <laughs> meld together after after a while. I, I'll blame it on. Uh, I'll just blame it on my beard. The longer my beard gets, um, the the mushier my brain gets. So, it, I'll just blame <laughs> it on that. Well, well, Thomas, Thomas, you have about fifty seven questions, and um, we're going to get to at least two of those. So, I'll let you dive in first, man. Awesome. Yeah. So, Sean, I know you have this book split up into five different sections, mm -hmm. uh, going from the comedies of Bruce Willis, uh, from there to the action genre, and then science fiction, and then uh, his work with Ochoa directors, and then you round it out with the Die Hard franchise. Uh, so, when did it click for you that this was how you wanted to structure and how you wanted uh, to split up these sections? So early on, but it definitely took some thought because uh, it's a lot of ground to cover, you know, but, but I didn't, I definitely didn't want to do like an A to Z, you know, then he did this, then he did that sort of thing. Um, and ultimately what I wanted to prove was that he's far more versatile than I think people give him credit for. Uh, when they think about Bruce Willis, they probably automatically go to the action genre. Understandably, he's one of the biggest action stars we've had, um, Die Hard being his signature franchise. But but I broke him into those categories, Thomas, because when I kind of looked over his career, I I was really impressed, and 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 you know, I hadn't I hadn't really thought about it this way. How often he took you know risks over the course of his career, how often he pivoted into other genres, how often he sought out you know filmmakers who had a strong voice who maybe weren't established at the time. You know, when he collaborated with M. Night Shyamalan, like M. Night wasn't a known director at that point. He gets together with Ryan Johnson at a really early stage in Johnson's career. Um, Quentin, obviously Quentin was was taking off with Reservoir Dogs, but like Pulp Fiction was still an untested property and no one really knew what, what Quentin was going to be before Bruce sort of got involved in that. So, so, so as I started thinking about like, okay, I want to write about Bruce Willis. Great. That's a fantastic idea. What am I going to say about him? How am I going to say it? Uh, and and right around that time, he announced his retirement. And I thought, okay, well, this is a great opportunity to think, like, if he's retiring, why does that matter? You know, why is this important? And in order to sort of break down his filmography, I thought by doing it in, in chapters or in segments that way, it would be easier for people to sort of break off. And this isn't – as much as this book, if you would like to, works – you know, start at the beginning, read it all the way through to the end, terrific. But it's also the type of book that I think you can pick up and you could just go right to the chapter of the movie that you love. Because I think people are going to do that anyway, and they should. Like, I would jump right to The Last Boy Scout, or I would jump to The Fifth Element or something like that. And I want people to be able to read my analysis, figure out what I thought about it, see it in the context of his own career, but then put the book down, go watch it, you know? Go, go watch 16 Blocks, you know, because you, you remember that he was in it, and then come back and read about what I said about it. So I wanted the book to kind of work in that way, uh, and I hope that I hope that ultimately it does. 
I really appreciated the way it was broken down because you were talking about reading individual chapters. And I was thinking about it from a standpoint of reading it in individual sections, like, you know, looking at the, the action mm. films uh, or, or, or looking at those um, those comedies as a section and, and seeing where there were similarities uh, in, in his approaches. And uh, this is we are looking at the cinema of Bruce Willis. I, I think you mention you do mention his TV appearances, especially uh, Moonlighting and that that kind of launch. But letting letting our, our viewers and the readers know this focuses on on cinema. One of the things, uh, another thing I really appreciated about this was when you go into the conclusion, I love those capsule reviews of these films. Mm. And I um, wanted to ask you relating to that, were these uh, reviews that you had previously written for all of these films or what were these reviews uh, that you decided after working on this book, hey, I need to go back and, and, and work this, rework some, but start some from scratch? No, that's a great question. Um, all of those are brand new original reviews that were written specifically for this book. And and someone asked me the other day, like one of the one of the hardest parts about tackling his career, but one that I thought that I was okay with is that it's a complete body of work, right? Like he he's in 115 films. Um, and if I'm going to do the book, like I better watch every single one of them. Otherwise what's the point kind of thing. Right. But, and, and so I even got a little bit paranoid because there were that, there was a rumor going around that Tarantino doing his last film might find like a role for Bruce. And I was like, please don't do that because then like my filmography thing is going to be incomplete and I got bad OCD and I'll just, you know, worry about not having every single one in there. Um, but the reviews at the end of that, and this is tough because you guys know this, um, you're putting something in a book, it's permanent, it's going to sit there, right? But, but, but my opinion about those movies is, so those capsules are really written, that each of them is written because I watched every single movie leading up to it and I wrote the capsule right after the thing. So that's how I felt about that movie in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Five years, 10 years from now, I can go back and read that capsule and my opinion on some of the movies, not all of them, like... It, it, 12 Monkeys is a perfect movie. It's going to be a perfect movie. You know, Die Hard's not going to get any better. It's it's Die Hard. But those ones that are like, oh, I gave it a three, you know, out of four. And now I've revisited it and it, it hit me a little bit differently. And it's a three and a half or, or it's a, oh, wait, it's actually a two. You know, that's a bit of putting something in a book and making it permanent that I'm like, I don't, I don't love that part of it because I'm an internet r reporter. I've, I've written for the web for my entire career. You can go back and change stuff on the web. <laughs> on the web it's not permanent right. those those reviews live there now and uh and i do have some agita about like oh yeah now that grade is there forever and I, even like at the end of the book i do this mount rushmore of bruce willis you know performances and i try to pick the four that to me are his most iconic i wrestled over that more than anything else in the book because i was like specifically one, one of the ones that i choose is is unbreakable and i choose unbreakable over the sixth sense those are interchangeable you know like if you ask me again in five years from now then maybe the sixth sense becomes one of the ones i put on there die hard has to be there you know i think pulp fiction probably has to be there the other two slots are are up for debate and and you know there's no wrong answer but but i hated having to put that into a into a chapter and yet i did it anyway i don't know why i, I really love that what you said because that is something that there are some people who think that once you write a review, it's fixed. You, you can't change yeah. your mind. But uh, the, the longer you sit with things, that the, more, the more you kind of digest, things can change. And, and I know exactly what it's like when I walk out of a screening and we have to give our or we, we have the opportunity to share with publicists our initial thoughts. And there are times well, very that diplomatic thoughts... the way you say that, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but those thoughts can easily change within, you know, hours. And, and that's happened to me before. And so uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you, you spoke on that because I think that's uh, a lot of times people, uh, when they look at critics work, they don't think that we're human too. And that, <laughs> that we have those mind changes that, that will happen from time to time. Oh, what's worse is hosting a podcast and having someone come up to you and say like, Hey, you said so-and-so about this movie. And I'm like, I said that that's, stupid. I don't think that anymore. Like my thought on that movie is completely changed now, but it should, it's an ever evolving medium, you know, and, and yep. you as the vessel for what the, the art's trying to say to you is you're changing constantly. So yeah. 
I, I it's 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 kind of awful to but <laughs> but I mean Ebert, who I adore, you know, I I love Roger Ebert because in his later years he would go back and revisit movies and rewrite reviews and admit candidly, like, no, it just hit me the wrong way the first time I saw it. Yeah. This is a, this is totally different. So I, yeah, anyone who says that whatever they said the first time is set in stone is crazy. <laughs> Thomas, get for it. <laughs> yep. So would you say there are any specific films from Bruce's career that almost felt like a new discovery for you in your journey of writing this book, even if it was maybe a film you've seen before, but maybe you got a new perspective on it from uh, the process of writing this book? Yeah, a bunch. Um, but the first one that comes to mind when you say that is is a movie called 16 Blocks um, with that Richard Donner directed. And I know I saw it when it came out um, and I know I enjoyed it, but but I didn't appreciate fully you know how good it is and how good he is in it um it's you know i came to understand bruce early on and loved him for the the, the sarcastic and charismatic and, and larger than life character that he played you know on moonlighting and of course john mcclain and and some of those parts but like later in in his career when he really did this internal acting and this introspective you know he kind of wore the weight of the world on his shoulders in in a bunch of of parts later on I grew to appreciate that style of acting a lot more. Um, so even like 16 blocks for sure, but then 12 monkeys, like to go back and revisit 12 monkeys, you come out of that movie and, and you, I think most people think about Brad Pitt because he's kind of chewing the scenery um, and, and swinging for the, for the fences. But Bruce holds that entire movie together, in my opinion, because I mean, you have to see the movie through his eyes. Twelve Monkeys is a is a guy who may or may not be from the future, and the future uh, potentially was devastated by a disease, and he's being sent back to get information on it. But he wakes up in a mental institution, and so you don't know if he's imagining that future or if, or if, which is his reality. And he sells that entire movie through facial expressions, you know, and and quiet. And and I really deeply admired Bruce's ability to be quiet in scenes. Um, it's what makes this, the Sixth Sense as good as it is. Um, it's what makes Pulp Fiction like there. There are long stretches of Pulp Fiction where he doesn't say anything. His opening scene opposite Marcellus Wallace is just him sitting there, you know, being told why he has to go down in the in the fight. And he has the confidence of a movie star to hold the camera with nothing but his face and yeah. no reaction. And it's just, uh, you know, I, I grew to, to to better appreciate that aspect of him. And and now in general, that kind of acting, like I just saw the bike riders, um, the Jeff Nichols uh, film and and really appreciated Austin Butler for sitting there and letting Tom Hardy and Michael Shannon, you know, go nuts and do their own thing, but knowing, hey, now is my time to be quiet and to let other people shine. And I think Bruce did that really, really well. You are joined uh, here on Meet Me at the Movies uh, with Sean O'Connell, Thomas Manning. We are talking Bruce Willis celebrating the cinematic legacy of an unbreakable Hollywood icon. The book is available now, and we are talking to the author. Uh, stick around. After this quick intermission, we're going to come back with more with Sean O'Connell, but after this. Won't you come and meet me at the movies? Won't you come and watch a flip? Education is our most powerful tool to improve and change our world. Hi, I'm Rhonda Benfield, your host for School Matters. Join me for a new program every other week with information from and about the students and staff of Cleveland County Schools. Discover what our schools are doing to challenge students and help them reach their full potential. You can catch us on Spectrum Cable Channel 19 or stream us live on C19.tv. Hi, I'm Steve Putnam, and I'd like to invite you to join me for the next Talk of the Town. Each week I get to meet with some of the most interesting people in Cleveland County. And each show is packed with information you need to know to stay connected to our community. From promoting upcoming events to discussing local subjects that impact you, Talk of the Town has a little something for everyone. Plus, we're on every day, so it's easy to catch up with us. That's Talk of the Town. Every day, every week, right here on C19 TV, Cleveland County's channel. Hi, I'm Nikki Bliss Carroll, your host for Cleveland Connections, the show that explores what's happening at Cleveland Community College. Join us as we sit down with members of faculty and staff to discuss programs of study, upcoming events, and other exciting campus news. We'll have a new show for you each month on C19 TV, or you can stream us online at C19.tv. 
Tune in and connect with Cleveland Community College on Cleveland Connection. Won't you come and meet me at the movies? Won't you come and watch a flick? Welcome back to Meet Me at the Movies. Noel T. Manning the second here with uh, Thomas Manning. Uh, co-hosting right here with Sean O'Connell. Uh, Sean is a is a friend, has been for a while, and uh, a, a three-time author. Look at that. I got it right. Three-time <laughs> author. Uh, <laughs> and the book today we're talking about uh, is uh, Bruce Willis uh, celebrating the cinematic legacy of an unbreakable Hollywood icon written by Sean O'Connell, and uh, it is available now. Uh, so, Sean, you know, before the uh, the break, you were talking a little bit about uh, just the, the versatility of Bruce and, um, you know, how exploring him on, if you look at him in, in moonlighting and then you kind of compare that to what he did in, uh, in 12 Monkeys, you'd say, wait, is this the same guy? And, uh, you know, I remember when Bruce was breaking out into something different. And, you know, it, it typically happens when you see comic talent trying to take on some things that are different. And people are like, well, can I buy it? Can I buy it? Um, did, did you ever have that question about Bruce early on, or did you know that there was there was something there before you ever actually saw it on screen? Um, I, I guess I never would have thought that he could have done the dramatic parts that he did, but but these th this is what helps our greatest actors, you know, last from generation to generation. Um, and, and I guess younger actors always try to do bigger and louder, you know, and then they get more quiet over the years. I'm thinking of some of the comparables to Bruce, I, I think is like a Paul Newman, you know, uh, who was, you know, brash and, and confident in his early years and then became more of a grizzled character actor later on. And I think you just, you wear your experience kind of on your sleeve. And I think eventually Bruce did that, but there was a, there's a point Noel where Kevin Smith, the director made a, a comparison to, to Bruce about, him coming out of television in that time, you know, the eighties, basically when, when Saturday Night Live was launching people on a regular basis into movies, uh, you see, you know, Chevy Chase come out of there, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, guys like that. Uh, Tom Hanks, you know, was big on bosom buddies and, and then was figuring out his movies. And, and Hanks at that time was, was doing bachelor party and splash and, and movies that, you know, were leaning into this comedic aspect. Bruce goes from moonlighting into, blind date you know where he's very much the straight man to to john larroquette and kim basinger and what kevin smith says is you know that that bruce willis is comparable um was bill murray like he he kind of should have had a bill murray career you know where he was like the the sarcastic sort of irascible like must up hair you know agent of chaos that Bill Murray ends up being in Ghostbusters and it catapults him in 1984 to a string of movies where he's just Bill Murray then. And Bruce has Die Hard and Die Hard puts him on this other path. So, you know, you talk about being pigeonholed and certain actors being cast as certain things. And it makes me, it, it made me wonder in the moment if those two switched, if, if Bruce did Ghostbusters and he could have, you know, he very easily, if you see David Addison and you put him in Ghostbusters, does he have that career? Does he become a funny man, you know, forever? Because Bruce got put into action and then he wanted to sort of bring his audience back around and, and be like, no, I'm also really funny. And we got Hudson Hawk, you know, and it was his song and dance because he loved music and tried to have a record career. It was his comedy, which he liked, which is this sort of physical Looney Tunes type comedy. And then the action that was kind of foisted on him. And the audience was like, no, <laughs> we don't want you doing this. This is too goofy. And so then he has to run back to the safety of The Last Boy Scout, you know, and, and Mercury Rising and, and generic action movies like oh, Striking Distance and stuff like that. You know, uh, but it makes me wonder if had he had success in those early days, because he's versatile enough and 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 talented enough that he could have done all those things. It's just, what did the, what did the audience accept him as? And I find that to be a pretty fascinating study. Wow. Love that. Love that. And Sean, over the, you know, two plus, 
uh, year process of writing this book. You've also had a unique opportunity because in your day to day, you're covering film and television uh, with Cinema Blend, with the Real Blend podcast, and you're oftentimes interviewing filmmakers and collaborators who have worked with Bruce at various points throughout his career. Uh, I know specifically when you uh, spoke with Ryan Johnson about Glass Onion, you got to ask him a question about uh, Bruce uh, with Looper. Uh, I think probably yep. one of your Tarantino conversations uh, around the same time uh, that Bruce had announced his retirement. So yeah. um, I just love to have you share a bit about that experience and you know what that means to you to have um, those those two things merge so beautifully and just your you know your day to day job uh, covering television and film and how that uh, merges with uh, what you were doing right in this book. See, I feel like I was cheating a little bit, right? Like because. I might not have gotten all of those people specifically, you know, for, for a book and specific and specifically a book about Bruce in which people were very protective of what was being said about him, uh, post the diagnosis. And, you know, the people were very cautious and wanted to make sure that this was going to be a book that wasn't trying to, um, not capitalize on the, on the announcement, but maybe like dissect him in any kind of way that would, that might tarnish his, his reputation. And, you can kind of let people know that you're trying to be as celebratory as possible. And I, I think real blend in a way speaks to the way that we approach film and that, you know, we're not here to tear down movies. We really do try to build them up and, and talk to the different people who are associated with it. So, you know, to talk to Ryan and to talk to Quentin and, and to get a sense of what Bruce meant to them uh, in the, in those periods and, and how important he was to their careers. That's when Ryan kind of shared with me that, you know, if he didn't get Bruce for Looper, you know, he, he, he might, probably wouldn't have been able to make the movie that he got a chance to make. He wasn't Breaking Bad yet. He wasn't Star Wars yet. You know, there's Ryan Johnson coming off of Bruker, uh, Brick and then the Brothers Bloom, which wasn't a, a big hit at all um, and needed uh, a, a star to essentially buy into the script, you know, because Joseph Gordon-Levitt was going to do that part regardless. He had been working with Ryan up to this point. But then it's like, can they can they play off of each other? Can they, you know, can they... Um, pull off that scene of younger and older person character T to tell you how it feels to, to do it in the day to day. Like it's, it's so rewarding, you know, because it, when you take on a, a book and I, I've said this to anyone who's thinking about writing a book, you have to love the topic. You are going to live with that topic, you know, every waking minute of every given day. And when you're doing your full-time job, all you want to do is get back to the book and tinker on it. You know, so when you know, like for Oppenheimer, <laughs> this is so sick. For Oppenheimer, I saw the room was going to be um, Matt Damon and Emily Blunt paired. And I was like, amazing. Emily Blunt was in Looper and Matt Damon was in Ocean's 12. I can ask the two of them. <laughs> like your brain immediately goes to, oh, yeah. sweet. I can ask him something about Bruce because I, because you're, 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 that's all you think about. That's all you think. You're in the churn of trying to figure that out. And um, so it, it's funny. Like there are times, it's, especially on Snyder Cut, you know, if there was anybody associated with the Justice League and I knew I could get a question in, the guys knew, Kevin and Jake, who co-host Real Blend with me, they knew that I was working on the book at, or they knew I was working on the Bruce book. And I was like, hey, we got to do this interview because this Rennie Harlan did Die Hard 2 and we got to talk to him about that. <laughs> so, you know, I, I feel like I'm cheating a little bit because I, I like not take certain opportunities. Like, obviously, I was going to do Oppenheimer, but like the minute you find out you have somebody you're like, Oh good. I can ask him about this. And then yeah. you, you get a good quote or, or you get a good story or an angle that makes you think about him differently. Like Ryan Johnson telling me how important Bruce was to running studio interference, you know, and letting him make the type of movie that he wanted to make. Then I started to see that through line in so many other filmmakers, Luke Besson saying, you know, I had this bizarro sci-fi world in the fifth element that no studio would take a chance on. And the minute that Bruce said he would do it, that meant opening weekend. You know, that meant I was guaranteed an opening. Terry Gilliam said the same thing. Terry Gilliam was like, no studio was going to back me for, for 12 monkeys. But the minute that Bruce said he wanted to do it, um, I was in and I could make the movie I wanted to do. And I never really thought about the power of, of a movie star because they, I don't think those movie stars have that power anymore. I don't think that they can get projects greenlit. Um, or even if they do, you know, it, it's the rock and it's some sort of, you know, tailor made thing that's, that's structured to him. It's not, it's not a risk. It's not a, a, a challenge. And I think Bruce backed risky projects and challenges because he wanted to see how they turned out. And I deeply admire that. Oh, I love that. I love that. And, and you're right. His name 
carried weight, and, and it still carries weight as we're talking about Sean O'Connell's book, uh, Bruce Willis Celebrating the Cinematic Legacy of an Unbreakable Hollywood Icon. Uh, where can people find the book, Sean? Um, anywhere books are, are sold, essentially. It's uh, available on Amazon. It's on uh, Barnes & Noble. Um, I'm trying to do uh, some local signings here in Charlotte, so um, follow me on social media on various channels, and once I have some of those locked up, I'll, I'll be sure to advertise them. But uh, as of right now, it's out on the shelves, so, so grab yourself a copy. And where to follow you? What What's the, the best way people follow you? Sure. So I, I'm on Cinema Blend on a regular basis. I'm the managing editor of that news site over there. Um, we do the Real Blend podcast. It comes out every Friday. Uh, again, a lot of movie talk, very similar. If you're a big fan of Meet Me at the Movies, uh, you want to come over and listen to Real Blend as well, too. Um, and then I'm on Twitter, Instagram, you know, all those different places. Just search Sean, o Sean O'Connell. There's there's a mixed martial artist uh, named Sean O'Connell. Uh, and then now apparently there's a an Irish footballer because I'm getting a lot of Google alerts about an Irish football uh, footballer named Sean O'Connell. Not surprising. It's a pretty common name. But um, now I'm third on the Google search list. Maybe do Sean O'Connell movies and then I'll show up. So. so so just any final thoughts you want to make sure you share with the audience before we wrap up, uh, Sean? I hope, like I said earlier, and I, I want this to really be the emphasis, like I, I hope everybody goes into this this um, book with an open mind about Bruce. You might think that he's like X amount, like, oh, he's just this. Um, but I think it's so important to emphasize that he played in so many different lanes um, and succeeded in, in a lot of those lanes. And I think you're going to pick up this book, even if you just flip through it, and you're going to see a bunch of titles of movies that you loved, you know, and you're going to be reminded of like, oh, yeah, that's right. He was in Armageddon. Oh my God, that's right. He's in, you know, the red, he's in red and red too. And how could he was? Oh, he's in the expendables. Why did he do that? You know, and I have those answers and, and that's all in there. And it's, uh, you know, again, written with a love and appreciation for who he was as a movie star. Cause I don't think there's anyone else out there like him. And I don't think the way that the industry is structured nowadays, we're going to get anyone else like him. So, uh, he's a rare case and I hope the book does him justice. One of the things when, uh, when I taught film studies, I look at, action films uh, of the 80s and kind of the impact and how that changed. And there are three names that I talk about, Schwarzenegger, um, Stallone with Rambo, and of course, Bruce Willis. And, you know, the, the three of them, what they were able to do at the box office, because of what they were willing to, to do from an action standpoint, changed, it changed the game. It definitely changed the game. It changed the game. But you know what I want to point out, Noel? The reason why I like to celebrate Bruce is because those other two guys could not do so many of the movies that he did like if you try to imagine stallone in bonfire of the vanities you know it or arnold <laughs> doing the sixth sense like right. it's just it, they don't ha it doesn't happen you could put bruce in predator i'm buying it you yeah. know yeah, exactly. uh bruce is bruce can be in demolition man i'm cool with it but you know stallone is not going to be in death becomes her i'm sorry <laughs> Sean O'Connell, thanks for joining us, uh, talking about Bruce Willis in your book. Uh, Bruce Willis, celebrating the cinematic legacy of an unbreakable Hollywood icon. Really appreciate you. Uh, Thomas Manning, thanks for, uh, thanks for your thought-provoking questions. Uh, you, always, uh, you always come to the, the table with, with great research, my man. I appreciate you so much. Uh, for, all ever, for everyone out there taking the time to spend with us, thank you. Uh, as well. And for this week's Meet Me at the Movies, for Sean uh, and for Thomas, I'm Noel T. Manning II, and that is a wrap. Many films to view until we meet again. Next time we see you, we'll gladly fill you in. We'll tell about the happy and the sad one. Talk about the good ones and the bad ones Many films to view Till we meet again